Father, thank you so much for the, the simple truth of this song, Lord, and how the train is bound for glory. Oh, we praise you for that. And now, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts now as we look into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. If you turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, we're going to look at a passage here, and you could say the title of this message is really three words, Lord, help me. Matthew 15, verse 21, uh, these verses here, uh, 15, 21 through 28, please follow along. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very, very hour. You know, we're going to study this passage here this morning, and it really represents a change in focus in our, in our Bible study, which the, the Bible largely deals with the Jewish people. And what we're going to look at this morning is a Gentile believer, a very important Gentile believer who represents for us the essence of Gentile believers. This is so important. We could call this week Gentile Believers Week. When have you ever been a, uh, heard of that before, Gentiles Believers Week? But this, this description of this woman here, it sets our theme for us. It sets the theme for us because, first of all, how she is, uh, she is presented to us in, in verse 21 is we are presented with a woman of uh, that a woman of Canaan came out. That's how she's described. A woman of Canaan came out. Really, there's a double meaning in in how that description is. On the surface, yes, she was a woman of Canaan. She came out from her location where she was to encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. But she really was a woman who came out to the Lord Jesus Christ from 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 her Gentile world a world that we're going to see. So calling her a woman of Canaan who came out describes for us the greatness of Gentile believers in the Bible. They came out of their Gentile world to the world of the God of Israel. They came out of their sins to the cleansing of the God of Israel. Their coming out was not easy, as we see in this woman, as they had to fight their way to the Lord Jesus Christ. She really represents to us a, a, a person with a battle of the soul. There was a battle of her soul. She had to fight her way to the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that, she is an illustration of really any soul that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Only for her, her battle, being a Gentile, was all the more intense. The Bible is a Jewish book. Let's face it. The Bible is a Jewish book. Every page is written by Jews. Oh, I know. Some people say that Luke was not Jewish because he didn't have a Jewish name, and he was involved in a profession that you never find Jews in as a doctor. <laughs> but the, every page, but, but Thomas is also not a Jewish name. And, 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 and every page, and Moses is not a Jewish name either, by the way. But anyway, every page of the Bible was written by, by, by Jewish people because that's what God said in Romans 3.1. He said, Romans 3.1 says, what advantage then hath the Jew? Uh, uh, or what profit is there in, in, in circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God, were committed the Bible. The Bible is a history about the Jewish people. The Bible identifies the Jewish people as God's people. But yet there are clear pictures in the, in, 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 uh, of the place of Gentile believers as part of God's people. God showed clearly in the Old Testament how the Gentiles would come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are only four women 
on the whole lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only four women are called out in that lineage, and they are all Gentiles. The Lord, and, and there is Tamar. She was a Canaanite uh, who, 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 who had Pharaohs uh, with her father-in-law Judah. That was a scandal. There was Rahab, the Canaanite, who was Solomon, had Boaz, and she was a harlot. That was a scandal. There was Ruth, who was of Boaz. She was sorry. She was a Moab. Moab. She was she was she was a Moabitess, and who with Boaz had Obed. She was she was from she was from Moab, and God said a person from Moab would never enter into the congregation of the Lord. That was a scandal. There was Bathsheba, who with David had Solomon. Bathsheba was a Hittite. She was raped. Her her husband was murdered. That was a scandal. But they all came as individuals to trust God, and they were best described by what it was said about Ruth in Ruth 2.12 when it says, a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. That's a description of the Gentile believers. Gentile believers are like Ruth. They fought their way to be under the wings of the God of Israel to trust in him. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ became the light of the world, which means that he became the light of the Gentiles. And it's interesting to see how that happened. It's interesting to trace back of how that actually occurred, that he became the light of the Gentiles, the light of the world, the light of the Gentiles. First, as is seen in our passage here, the Lord Jesus Christ was sent personally by God the Father for one purpose— to bring back the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he spoke about that commission in our passage in verse 24 when he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his exclusive uh, mission, to bring back Israel to God. That was a very real personal responsibility for him. He came with a burning desire to please God the Father and bring the Jewish people back to God. So when we read in John 11, John 11, he came unto his own. That's a statement that we should understand that he came to the Jewish people with his whole being to bring them back to God. He planned how he would bring them back to God. He spoke to them with very carefully selected words with the intent of bringing them back to God. He really wanted to bring them back to God. And he tried all that he could to bring them back to God. But he did not override their wills. In the end, he, he stepped back and let it be each person's decision of whether they would come to God or not. In the end, The reality is, the truth is, he faced an utter failure. And if an utter failure, which is reflected, which is described in the second half of that verse of John 1.11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to them as their Messiah. He came to them as their shepherd. He came to them as their savior. He came to them as their king. And he tried so hard to have them receive him as their Messiah, shepherd, savior, king, who was going to bring them back to God. But they rejected him as their Messiah sent by God the Father to bring him back to God. And they said, we don't believe that he's the Messiah, and we choose to wait for our Messiah. They rejected him as their shepherd who would lead them back to God. They would lead them back to God through repentance, and they said, they, they, and they said we, are, we are already with God. We don't need anyone to lead us back to God. We don't need an intermediary. We go directly to God. He came to them as their shepherd. He re, they rejected him as their shepherd, and they said, we don't need a Savior because we go directly to God. They, they rejected him as their king who would rule over him, and they said, Very, very, very plainly, we will not have this man to rule over us. That's really what's meant in John 1.11 when it says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. He did everything perfectly. 
There was nothing wrong that what he did. It was perfect. The seed was good. It was the word of God. He came unto his own. Their decision was his own received him not. They did not receive him as their Messiah, their shepherd, their savior, and their king. So he failed. And he took his failure very personally and very hard. He acutely felt the personal failure deep down in his soul. And he spoke about how he took this failure to bring Israel back in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49 is an amazing chapter, an amazing passage in the Bible in the Old Testament. But in verse 4 was where he spoke about the feeling of having failed to bring Israel back when he said in Isaiah 49, 4, Isaiah 49, 4, then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught. He called his work to bring Israel back to God a labor in vain. He felt like he had just worked for the wind. He felt like he had nothing to show for it. He called all his strength, all his effort that he put to, uh, into trying to bring Israel back to God, he said, I spent my strength for naught. And anyone who's worked in trying to bring the Jewish people back to God has experienced those same feelings as the Lord is expressing here in Isaiah 49.4. Anyone as, as working so hard and having no results to show. We've just finished the summer blitz. Well over a half a million doors knocked. Anyway, I don't have to go into much detail about that. So as expending all the strength for nothing. And you can see this, like I said, you can see this in the reports of the summer blitzers and may God bless them greatly as they're finishing up this Friday for their unfailing hope as they write things like, as you've read them, write things like, I hope this one gets saved before the summer is finished. I didn't get to lead him to the Lord now, but maybe next time. Their hope never changed. And God the Father saw the discouragement of God the Son. He saw the discouragement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ about this. He encouraged him in, in the next verse in Isaiah 49, 5. In Isaiah 49, 5, where we read, and now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. So the Lord Jesus Christ said that God the Father formed him in the womb of Mary, in Mary's womb, to be his servant that would bring Jacob or the Jewish people back to God. And as I said, he was so focused on bringing the Jewish people back to God that he said that he, was, that he was formed in the womb to accomplish this goal. That's what made it so hard for him. That's what made it so hard for him when he failed to bring the Jewish people back to God because he was formed to do this work. Then God the Father stepped into his discouragement and, God, and the Lord Jesus said what God the Father did. And he said in the next verse in Isaiah 49, 6, Isaiah 49, 6, and he said, it's a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the world. So the Lord Jesus tells us that God the Father said to him in Isaiah 49, 6, it was just a light thing. It was a little thing for him to be a servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. And God the Father said, to bring the Jewish people back to God, light thing, little thing. I'm going to give you an even greater job of being a light to the Gentiles. I'm going to give you an even more glorious title uh, than being the restorer of Israel. You're going to be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And that's what makes this chapter in, in, in Isaiah 41, so pivotal, so pivotal, 49, so pivotal for us to understand the Jews and the Gentiles or what the Bible calls the natural olive tree and the wild tree in Romans 11, 17 through 24, Romans 11, 17 through 24. You just can't understand there's this passage in, in, in Romans 9, 10, 11, especially Romans 11, without understanding what's being said here in Isaiah 49, Isaiah 49. It was because of the rejection of the Jewish people that the Lord Jesus became the light of the Gentiles. It was because of the rejection of the Jewish people that he became God's salvation to the end of the earth. 
And that's how the gospel, which was for the Jewish people, came to the Gentiles. That's how it came. And with this clearly in sight now, we can understand the great significance of, the, of this history, of this brave Gentile woman who pressed her way through many obstacles, which we're going to see, into the kingdom of God. This explains to us the meaning when we read in Romans 11, 11, Romans 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles to provoke him to jealousy. And when the Lord Jesus was given to be the light of the Gentiles and God's salvation to the end of the earth, that was the time of great celebration. There was a great celebration. God the Father made a special call for those to come and celebrate. He called on heaven to celebrate. He called on earth to celebrate. He called on the mountains to celebrate. A great celebration that the Lord Jesus was now going to be the Savior of the Gentiles. And that's what we see in verse 13 of Isaiah 49, Isaiah 49, 13, where God calls out, Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy on the afflicted. So when Israel rejected the Lord Jesus as their Messiah, as their shepherd, as their savior, as their king, all of it, then God the Father turned to believing Gentiles and included them as part of his people. That's where you came in, (laughs) by the way. The Jewish people now see how God has responded to their unbelief. The Jewish people see how God has responded to their unbelief and their rejection and, 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 and how God has now turned to the Gentiles like Paul. This was a very important time in Acts 13. In Acts 13, this was the turning point. In Acts 13, 45, this woman we're reading about is the, is the forefront, for, 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 first fruit. She's the beginning, but the, the real turning starts in Acts uh, 1345. Acts 1345. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, envy and spake those things against and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And when Paul and Barnabas were confronted with this aggressive rejection of the Jewish people to the Lord Jesus Christ, they turned to the Gentiles, and God turned to the Gentiles. And when they did turn to the Gentiles, the Gentiles did the opposite of what the Jewish people did. They received the Lord as the the Lord Jesus Christ, as their Messiah, their shepherd, their savior, their king. And that was amazing. And that was an amazing thing for the apostles to see when they came to the conclusion in Acts 14, 27. Acts 14, 27, and when they were come, they had gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So their conclusion was that God had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And they were seeing that when God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, that was a fulfillment of, of Isaiah 49.6, Isaiah 49.6 that we saw. It's a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Israel and to restore the preserved of, of Jacob and preserve of Israel. I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. They called that phenomena, which it was, of the Gentiles receiving the Lord Jesus as their savior, savior and shepherd and king. They called that phenomena in Acts 14.27, God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. But God called that phenomena of believing Gentiles, I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So it was a wonderful phenomena where we saw that God, as I said, he calls, he calls for a great celebration. And everybody is happy. The mountains, the heavens, the earth, everybody is rejoicing except for Israel. <laughs> Israel was not happy. Israel was not happy about the Gentiles coming to God. Why? Israel saw that the Gentiles had the peace of God. They saw that they were the subjects now of the love of God, that they had the assurance of the friendship with God, that they, were go- that they knew that they were going to heaven. And they also saw they didn't. And that made Israel really sad and depressed. And Israel spoke about th- how they felt in the next verse of Isaiah 49, 14, Isaiah 49, 14, Isaiah 49, 14. But Zion said, 
The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. So when the Jewish people saw that, that God had turned to the Gentiles and how the Gentiles had come to the Lord Jesus Christ with great rejoicing and received him as their God, as their Savior, as their King, then the Jewish people said in Isaiah 49, 14, 49, 14, the Lord hath forsaken me and thy Lord hath forgotten me. The Jewish people said, without God, we're finished. There's no hope for us. Just look at the, the Holocaust. You can see that God is not with us or for us. And they came to, they come to realize that the Gentiles received what they rejected. They're going to heaven while we're left out. Gentiles found what we lost. They're now included as part of God's people. And the Jewish people are sad, and they conclude that God has forsaken them and God has forgotten them. And that's when God steps in wonderfully. He steps in with the next verse, and, and God steps in and says, no, I have not. And that's in Isaiah 49, 15. Isaiah 49, 15. As Israel is concluding, we're forgotten, we've been forsaken, God steps in and says, no, I haven't. And Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb that they may, for, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee? Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. So here Israel sees all these Gentiles coming to God, coming to the God of Israel and being welcomed by him as part of his people. Israel sinks into a state of depression. They sink into a state of despair. And with the Holocaust, Israel Israel concludes, God has forsaken us, God has finished with us, God has forgotten us. And that's when God steps in and says, I have not, I have not forgotten the Jewish people. If a woman can forget her sucking child on her breast, then I can forget you, Israel. And God says to the downcast of Israel, others may forget you, but I will not forget you, Israel. The Gentile church may forget you, Israel, but I will not forget you. Look, Israel, I have graven you on the palms of my hands and your walls are continually before me. The truth is that God is expressing that God maintains a broken heart for Israel as he turns to the Gentiles. So this is the full picture here that we have of the time we live in right now. And that's why the scripture calls the time we live in now in Luke 21, 24, Luke 21, 24, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, they shall be led away captive of all nations, Israel shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We live in the times of the Gentiles. We live in the times described in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Romans eleven twenty five 25 says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel. Thank God it's only in part. Thank God for five salvations out of the over 500,000 doors that were knocked on in the summer blitz. That's what it meant by in part. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. We live in the time of the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. The fullness of the Gentiles is coming in. And the Gentiles have come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, they are coming to God. They will continue to come to God because darkness has driven them. In Isaiah 60, verse 2, Isaiah 60, verse 2. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee as glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. The Gentiles were in darkness, a darkness that could be felt, the same kind of darkness that Moses brought as, a, as one of the plagues in Exodus 10.21. Exodus 10.21, it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Such a penetrating darkness. Such a personal sin. So badly felt. But in Isaiah 11.10, Isaiah 11.10, it says, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. The Gentiles sought the Lord because of the darkness. The Gentiles sought the Lord for the rest. He offered rest to the weary souls. He said that in Matthew 11.28. Matthew 11.28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Zechariah 2.11, Zechariah 2.11 says, many nations, that's the word goyim, Gentiles, many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. The Gentiles pressed themselves into the Lord to become part of God's people. 
Jeremiah 16, 19. Jeremiah 16, 19 says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of my affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. That's the confession of the Gentiles, especially for the Gentiles coming from Indonesia and animistic Africa, even Japan, as they've come to God and they've said, the Jeremiah 16, 19, Jeremiah 16, 19 confession. Lies, lies, lies. Our fathers have inherited lies. Vanity, things wherein there's no profit. But when God does bring the Jewish people back to him, the Gentiles will continue to fight their way because of this deep hunger, this deep need in their souls. And we see that in the, prophetically in Zechariah 8, 23. Zechariah 8, 23 where it says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass, that ten men shall take hold of all languages of the earth, of the nations, of the goyim, of the Gentiles, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Do you know what these Gentiles are saying? They're saying, we don't care where we have to go. We don't care if we can't eat pork anymore. <laughs> We don't care if we can't drive on Saturday. As long as God is there, because we must have God. We see there's a tenacity there. There's a tenacity to take hold of the skirt of one of the Jews and say, we'll go with you because we know that we need to find God. We'll go with the Jews because we know that we got to find God. He's with them. It's that very tenacity of spirit that we see in this Canaanite woman here. She's the first fruits of all this. She's the first fruits of the great turning of the Gentiles to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a transition period we're reading about where the Lord is, is he's failed to bring Israel back to God and, and, and God the Father is giving the Lord Jesus to be the light of the Gentiles and his salvation to the end of the earth. It's only when we see this clearly that we can understand this history here in, in Matthew 15 that otherwise seems very strange, so out of character for the Lord Jesus. But th that, now that was a long introduction to this history, but I had to do that. I didn't have to, but I had to do it because uh, I, to make this account understandable. Now, with that in mind, we see in verse 21 in Matthew 15, Matthew 15, 21, how this Canaanite woman represents the Gentiles coming to God. It says she, in verse 22, she cried unto him. She cried. That cry was made to him because of the tenacity of, uh, 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 in her soul that she was following right in the steps of Jacob, right in the steps of Jacob who wrestled with Jehovah Jesus all night long and he fought with him with that same tenacity of Genesis thirty-two twenty-six. 26, Genesis thirty-two twenty-six. 26. He said, let me go. Jehovah Jesus says, let me go for the day breaketh. He said, Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. He was not going to take no for an answer. He was fighting. The cry of this woman is that same spirit. It's that same spirit of tenacity. It's described in Isaiah 60, verse 3, Isaiah 60, verse 3, where the Gentiles are fighting their way to come to the Lord. And the cry of this woman is with the same tenacity. The cry of this woman is like grabbing a hold of the skirts of the Jew and say, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're not going to, to give up in, in, in Zechariah 8.23. We're not going to give up. We're going to drive ourselves into become a part of, the, of God's people. Gentile believers fight to overcome all the obstacles. They fight their way to the Lord. That's why this history of this Canaanite woman is so important when it says in verse 21, behold, a Canaanite woman came out. That's why this history of the Canaanite woman is so important because it illustrates the nature here of the fighting spirit, the tenacity. Just her description in verse 20, in verse 33, verse 33. Just her description, a woman of Canaan. She was a Canaanite. She was excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. She couldn't change that. She was born that way. But that didn't stop her. She looked at herself and said, Canaanite or no Canaanite, I must have Jesus. I will fight my way to him. That was the first obstacle that stood in her way. That was the first obstacle that, that blocked her help. She was born on the wrong side of the tracks. But she didn't let that stop her because she may have been born on the wrong side of the tracks, but that didn't, tracks, but that didn't stop her from crossing over the tracks to the Lord Jesus, and that's what she did. Now we see that what she said when she cried to the Lord Jesus. She said, have mercy on me, 
have mercy on me. She had a cry for mercy. It shows that she had no right to him for, to help her, so she's crying for mercy. Mercy. She's saying mercy that all her hope is not based on what she was or had. Her hope, her cry for mercy was showed that 100% of her hope was based on who the Lord Jesus was. All her confidence was based on this fact of uh, Deuteronomy 431. Deuteronomy 431. The Lord thy God is a merciful God. She knew that. Now, at Nehemiah 9.17, Nehemiah 9.17, thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. So with her call for, for mercy, she takes her place right alongside the sinner who cried to the Lord in Luke 18.13, Luke 18.13, the publican. The publican standing afar off would not so much as lift his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the Lord Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So she cries for mercy. She's singing the right tune to God. God's listening as opposed to the person who comes to God and sings the tune about his credentials. God doesn't listen. Somebody says, I'm good and righteous. That's not the right tune for God to respond to. She cries to him, and she, then she cries to him in verse 22, O Lord, thou son of David. Son of David? What is a Canaanite saying here? Canaanites don't talk about a man being God. Canaanites don't talk about a son of David, but this woman did. David was not the king of the Canaanites. David was the king of the Jews, but not for this Canaanite. She called Jesus Lord. And when she said that, she was saying, you are God. You are God. You are God who became a man, as the scriptures said. When this Canaanite called him the son of David, she was saying that I'm coming to the king of the Jews. And when this Canaanite called him the son of David, she was agreeing with the Lord Jesus who told another Canaanite woman, another Samaritan woman, another Samaritan woman in John 4.22, John 4.22, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So when this Canaanite called him, in, in this verse, Lord thou son of David, this Canaanite was saying, in, in, in saying, we worship, we know not what. I know salvation is of the Jews. And then she having cast herself on the king of the Jews, she makes a request. Verse 22, she makes a request. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Her poor daughter, her poor daughter was out of control with, with, with fits of anger and supernatural strength that her mother could not control her. This poor mother looked into the crazed eyes of her daughter and she saw that those are not the eyes of my daughter. Those are the eyes of another being. She is possessed. She is controlled with the devil. And this mother then runs out of her house, utterly helpless, knowing that she had no power over this devil that had possessed her daughter. And this Canaanite woman knew that she could not return home to face her daughter possessed with the, with, 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 with the devil. And so she had to fight for help, and that's what she's doing. This was the trouble that pressed this Canaanite woman to the Lord Jesus and drove her to call him God and to call him the son of David. Her first obstacle was that she had to fight her way over the barrier of being a Canaanite and confess that Jesus was the God of Israel and the son of David. Then she came to a second obstacle. That ob this obstacle also blocked her way. And then we read about that in verse 23. He answered her not a word. <laughs> he shunned her. He, 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 she found no response from the Savior. He didn't acknowledge her. He didn't look at her. He didn't, he, she can yell all she wants. He's pretending she's not there. Keep in mind here, that the Lord is, the Lord Jesus is still in the mode of realizing I've been formed in my mother's womb to be my father's servant to bring the Jewish people back to God, and I'm not going to be deterred by a Gentile woman who's trying to get me off track. So, you know, being ignored is so hard to endure. 
that this woman in all her desperation, she wasn't even acknowledged by the Lord Jesus. That was her second obstacle that she had to fight through, that, she did, that, that would not dis- discourage her from continuing on. Then her third obstacle came, which came from not the Lord, but from the disciples in verse 23. His disciples came besought him saying, send her away for she crieth after us. So now she hears this. She says this third obstacle that she's got to fight through is the close friends of the Lord, the confidence, the disciples, his disciples. They're tell, he, he, she hears them tell him that, that they're accusing her She's bothering us with her crying. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure the, the kind of looks that they must have looked at her, they must have looked at her and said, you Canaanite, you know, leave the Jewish Messiah alone. But she fought her way through that. She fought her way through that third obstacle. She persisted in crying out to the Lord. Then she comes to her fourth obstacle, which was really hard for her. When the Lord finally does speak to her, oh, great, he's looking at me. He's going to speak to me now. Some hope is going to come. Instead, a big wall in verse 24. Verse 24, he answered and said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You don't have the credentials. You're not part of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He looks at her, he, and again, he is realizing that his calling, and he must focus on bringing Israel back to God. Time is limited. Time is short. Here is a woman that's not part of Israel. She represents a distraction from the Lord from doing what he's called to do. So he addresses her in verse 24 with, with I'm not sent to you. I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So now this poor Canaanite woman realizes that her birth is against her, and she hears the Lord tell her that she has crossed over the tracks to Israel's side. And when he tells her that he's been sent only to the lost, the Jewish people, we can see how the Lord is trying so hard for the Jewish people to come back to God. He wants them to accept him as their Messiah, as their shepherd, as their savior, as their king. And we can see how he's filled with this responsibility that he has gotten from God the Father. Bring back, you're my servant. Bring back Jacob to God. So he tells this woman, Look, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and you're not part of that. This was the fourth very hard obstacle that she did not give up from. Now, in the face of this very hard fourth obstacle, the faith of this, this Canaanite woman shines when it says just simply in verse 25, then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. She worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. She showed us what real worship is. She shows us that we worship the Lord Jesus Christ when we call him Lord, when we cast ourselves on him for his mercy with one request, help me. When you come to my house and and, and you turn down the walkway to the front door there, There's a rock, and on that rock is this verse. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. Why? Because the reason it's there is because it's a principle for all of life. For every need, come to the Lord Jesus. Worship him by calling him Lord and asking him for help. She leads us. She guides us. She's our example. This was how the woman fought through the fourth obstacle. Then came the final and the most hard fifth obstacle that she had to face. As now the Lord further replies to her in verse 26 when he says, but he answered and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dog, to dogs. He just called her a dog. <laughs> a dirty, mangy dog. I mean, if you've got any pride, you're going to walk away. <laughs> I'm not going to get called a dog. He has just accused her of trying to get him to take children's bread of, the Isra- of Israel's bread, the children of Israel's bread, and to cast it to, a, to her, a dog. Now, at this point, it would have been real easy for Mrs. Canaanite here to just say, that's it. That's it. I've had enough abuse. I've just been called a dog. I'm finished. You can keep your God of Israel. I'm out of here. It would have been really easy for her to do that. Real easy. But not this Canaanite woman. Her pride was not hurt, even by being called a dog. And she thought to herself, he just called me a dog. Oh, that's my opportunity. She says, that's my opportunity I've been looking for. This is great. I've been called a dog. I'll take the place of a dog. (laughs) So he spoke to me. 
He spoke to me. I'm going to use what he said to appeal to him. And then she made a statement of no protest, no contest. When she said, beautiful, in verse 27, she said, truth, Lord, Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She says, truth, Lord. She says, if you want to call me a dog, color me a dog. I gladly accept the title of being a dog. I'll be a dog. And then with this tenacity of spirit, she's so quick on her feet. She thinks and she she comes, she says, okay, I'm a dog. But dogs live. And how do dogs live? They eat by living the, by the, by, they live by eating the crumbs that fall from the table. She's so quick on her feet. She jumps and she says, you're right, you're right, Lord. That's that, 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 it's not right to cast the children's bread to me, a dog, but dogs do eat the crumbs that fall off the, the, the master table. Hey, Lord, how about a few crumbs? Now, when the Lord heard that, he was just astounded. He was just astounded. Another gospel, it says, for that saying, because you said that, because you thought of that, because you were so quick, he no longer refers to her as a dog. In verse 28, now she's woman. Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. His soul was so thirsty for that kind of response from the Jewish people, he never found it. He never found that kind of faith in Israel. But he did with her, and he rewarded her. And with that statement, this woman won. She won the fight. She won the battle. She had fought through with her tenacity over these five obstacles that blocked her way to help through the Lord Jesus. She persisted, and that's the reason why. She's a forerunner of the Gentiles who with persistence would fight their way into the kingdom of the king of the Jews. So what we're seeing today is that this fighting tenacity here of this great Canaanite woman who fought her way through one obstacle after another until she finally got through to the Lord. And for those, room, for those, those are the reasons there that this person is our model. She's our model. She's our model on how we should fight to the Lord. She's our model for Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16 when it says, let us come boldly, Or if you will, let us come with tenacity. Or let us come with a fighting spirit. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this woman. We're looking so forward to meeting her. Help us, Lord, to have the flexibility, the tenacity, and to take your words and to argue and not give up until we reach our source of help, the Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.